Today is Thursday, June 12, 2014. My name is Juliana Nicolasian. Also with me is Tanya Fincham. And today we're in Nor Norman, Oklahoma, interviewing Max Newberry with the Newberry Ranch in Harmon County, Oklahoma. This interview is being conducted as part of the Oklahoma Centennial Farm Families Oral History Project. Max, Max thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, let's uh, start by learning a little bit more about you. Could you tell us how your family came to Oklahoma? My grandfather uh, came from Greenville, Tennessee, when he was about 23 or 4 years old. And he came along with his brother and a cousin uh, by train uh, because he heard about some land being that was available for homesteading in what was then Greer County, Oklahoma. And so they came by train to Quanta, Texas and then uh, bought some horses and, and uh, came up to the Schroeder community and filed on land adjacent to each other. And why did they pick that particular piece of land? I never really got to talk to my grandfather about that. Being young, I wasn't curious about things like that. So it was probably about the uh, only places available, and uh, uh, and it was fairly decent land. So uh, I, I don't really know the true details. Can you tell me a little something about the Schroeder community? The Schroeder community was. Uh, very vibrant community uh, for many years. Uh, it really didn't consist of very much other than a uh, country store, a blacksmith shop that my uh, grandfather's brother ran. His brother was Jim and his cousin built the uh, Schroeder store. The store uh, was had a post office uh, about a year or two after the after the store was built, and the post office got there by uh, because of the efforts of a man by the name of Schroeder, hence the name of Schroeder rather than Newberry for the town. <laughs> and so, it uh, later uh, there was a uh, a washer house with, uh, as I recall, some thirty or forty uh, washing machines. That's before people could afford to have their own generally. And uh, at one time there was a cotton gin uh, adjacent to the town uh, and my dad recalls the night that it burned down and he was only about uh, seven or eight years old so that would be about 19, 10 or 12. And so it never was rebuilt. Uh, later on uh, a man who ran the store uh, built another uh, blacksmith shop adjacent to it, and uh, that's that's still standing. That's the only structure still standing. the The old concrete foundation was there. They also put in a uh, roquet court, and roquet is similar to croquet, except that it is uh, bounded by a sturdy concrete wall, and it has uh, angular uh, perimeter. And it has the wickets are, are like a construction still, because the the ball is a very hard, small ball, not as big as the wood. But that was a community gathering place, and uh, it was hard sand that it was played on, and it took a lot of skill. And when we think of the croquet court, we don't think of any skill particularly, but with this. When you saw a good player, you recognize that there's a lot of skill involved because they would ricochet that ball in a certain way and position themselves and get the other person's ball out of the way where they had a good shot. They, so there's a lot of strategy involved if you were good. Hmm. And I, I remember the, when I was growing up there, they had to, to get people to come in and shop at the, gross, uh, the store. Uh, they had... Uh, had a wagon there where the local musicians would get up there <laughs> and play uh, guitars and fiddles and sing as best they could and, and it was the only entertainment we had so we enjoyed it and uh, you know the store back then was 
what we call a 7-Eleven today. It had everything. It had uh, gas and which you pumped yourself, the old glass bulb. Uh, and they would make a bologna sandwich for you if you'd like. And, and uh, so it was adjacent to all of our land. And so it was real convenient if we had a uh, had a cotton shower, or what we call a little cotton shower. We, that was when you're out there in the cotton field and, and you got to get out of the cotton field because a little shower came over and you'd run to the store and get a Coke or something. <laughs> Orange back then. Well, going back to your your grandfather, and his name was Henry, correct? Right. When he staked his claim on the land, what were some of the first things he did? Where what was what was his living conditions like? He had to uh, first uh, dig a hole in the ground, uh, the dugout hole, and which was is still the depression is still there. And so the first thing he did was uh, dig that hole and uh, and build a top over it to where he could see out and get light in. And that was in 1900 when he did that. And so he stayed in that by himself until he was married in December of 1903. And to help support himself during that time, he taught school in a little town called Hester, which was about 10 miles to the east. I don't think the town exists anymore. It was south of uh, Mangum. And my grandfather, Henry, had uh, two years of college in Greenville, at Tecumseh uh, College, I believe the name of it was. And uh, so he was well educated for the time, and, uh, and he, uh, he supplemented his income while he was developing the farm that way. And was it a one-room school? Country school? The Hester? I have no idea okay. about that. It, it, uh, okay. Probably was. Are you aware of, of some of his early crops he was trying to to grow or to cultivate? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I didn't have any conversations with him as such, but the is very common in what we grew when I was growing up, and I'm sure it was the same thing, was uh, cattle feed, uh, sorghum, and uh, I know they had a sorghum mill, so they I know they grew sorghum, and uh, they had, uh, of course, uh, wheat and cotton. I, I know he, he grew cotton. And I'm assuming he grew wheat because that was a very common crop grown around there. And alfalfa was also grown for the, uh, for the cattle. And he met his wife in 19, he got married in 1903? 1903. <laughs> and how did, how did he meet his wife? Well, she lived as the crow flies one mile to the southwest. And her brother, Riley Kernut, came from Denton, Texas and brought the family along. Their father had died the previous year, so they brought their their mother and and all the siblings along. And they homesteaded there and uh, each one homesteaded that was old enough homesteaded land adjacent. And uh, so they were uh, and got to know each other that way. Now my grandfather at that time was when they got married, uh, he was about 10 years older than her. He was 29 and, and grandmother was 19. And uh, so uh, the, the story that uh, they were trying, to, my grandmother's family were trying to talk her out of it. Says, you don't know what that mine might have done back in Tennessee. And he, you, you just don't know his background. <laughs> they, they weren't encouraging the union. <laughs> and what was her name? Exy. E X C Y. Okay. She was uh, she was a very intelligent lady, and as was my grandfather, and uh, but only had about eight years of education. Uh, but uh, 
very, very brilliant. And by the time they married, did he move out of the dugout? They, he built a, a two-room house adjacent to the dugout. And I'm sure he must have built that when he found out they were going to get married because he wouldn't bring a wife into the dugout. <laughs> a, new, a new bride at least. And uh, so they, uh, they had their first, they lived in that from 1903 to 1913 when the house across the street was built. Hmm. At that time they had uh, four children so they, they had to get more space. And how many children did uh, Henry and Exie have? They had five, two, two girls and three boys. Okay. The, uh, my dad was the oldest, and uh, then the youngest was born in 1915. Hmm. They all went to uh, OSU, hmm. and uh, four of them graduated with degrees. The other one got married before she graduated. And uh, it's interesting that my grandmother Exie's brother who had five children, they all got degrees. So two families adjacent back in the 1910s and 20s, all to have college degrees is very, very unusual. Very, very much so. Yeah. Hmm. Well, did he continue to teach school and also work the farm? Yes, he, uh, he taught uh, he didn't continue teaching in Hester. Uh, he only did that a couple of years until uh, he got married and then he didn't want to, you know, he had to ride his horse that 10 or 12 miles or further to that school and stay away. So uh, he quit teaching at that point in time and began uh, as the first mail carrier for the Schroeder community. Uh, and his ex's brother was the first postmaster there at Schroeder, uh, and uh, he was uh, his name was Riley, hmm. Riley Denton. So it was. Uh, There's a lot of people in that area at that time, because you know they only homesteaded 160 acres. Well, families were, you know, at least four kids, and some of them six or seven kids. So you multiply four times that and you've got 25 people at least per section. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a lot of people around there. In fact, they, they did a study that in the 1920s in Harmon County there was 33 schools at one time. And of course most of those were only going to the 8th grade. But, uh, and now there's only one. In 19, that happened in 1990, that all the schools uh, were closed uh, except for the one at Hollis. And how long did he serve uh, with the Postal Service? Well, he, he served for about, uh, must have been at least 10 years uh, because they moved, they closed the post office at Schroeder, oh, sometime around 1910 or so and moved it to the Dryden community. So he had to drive with his horse and buggy uh, about four or five miles to the Dryden community to pick up the mail and then go out and deliver it. Would he deliver mail by horse and buggy? Yeah, and I've got pictures of that, uh, of him, which must have been pretty tough in some <laughs> of those winter weather. Uh, and he was farming at the same time. Uh, at that time, uh, when, when he built the house across the street, uh, across the road, uh, the Sears house that was, he, that was shipped into Quanta, Texas, uh, and people think it was just a kit. Well, they sent you the blueprints and, the, and some of the things, trim and things of that nature, but basically, uh, you, you had to be pretty handy 
or have somebody that was. And grandfather was uh, fortunate to have uh, uh, a neighbor who was my grandmother's kin to come over and help. And uh, so they built the house uh, themselves out of that beautiful house. It was the biggest house around. Uh, it, it had a uh, big front porch. It had four bedrooms upstairs uh, with a big foyer upstairs that the steps laid up to, led up to. They had uh, downstairs we had two living areas and two two bedrooms and a bath and a big kitchen uh, big enough uh, to hold a dining area and a big pantry and and so it was uh, and, and with a cellar uh, where they kept all of their canned goods and things of that nature so it was a real nice house uh, back then. Did he have help putting everything together and building it? Oh yeah yeah he uh, I really don't know how talented my grandfather was in that regard but uh, he had uh, he had some people that were kin to my grandmother that were very talented. They knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the foundation is still there and in good shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why did they choose the location across the street? I really don't know, uh, but it was it was a good site. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it was on a little rise, and uh, so I assume it was just the best side around. Well, as, as your, your grandfather started progressing in his career with the Postal Service, were they doing anything different on the farm? Were they introducing anything new? Grandfather was one of the first to do uh, contour farming. And, you know, my dad tells the story that people kind of made fun of him because he was making curves and everybody said a good farmer made straight rows. <laughs> well, my, father, my grandfather, some of his land was rolling and it was washing, and so he decided to, to do the contour farming. And he, he did that as well as putting in terraces. And uh, so and we, we've tried to follow through with that. Uh, my father uh, had a good record of... Uh, good soil conservation and, and and my brother and I uh, did the same thing. My brother partnered with me in the farming operation and uh, we neither one worked on the farm because we had other careers but we we wanted to be part of the farming operation and we partnered with other people who did the actual work. But uh, we, we received the uh, conservation award for the county uh, back in the 1980s, the work we did. Well, let's talk a little bit about your father. Uh, his name was Earl. Earl. And you told us he was the oldest. Yes. And um, did he share any remembrances with you about growing up on the farm? Oh yeah, he was. Uh, he was uh, shared a lot of memories. I hope I can remember some of them. That I remember one vividly. He told me he was he was about four or five years old, and so this would be 1909. And he was out on the road just across from the house, and he sees this thing coming down the road. He didn't know what it was, and it scared him to death. And he went crying and running to his mother and says, there's a buggy coming down the road without horses. <laughs> and he, uh, I never will forget that story. And he, he uh, at that, I remember when the, the plane carrying the space shuttle back to Altus to refuel on its way to Florida. It was flying over the farm and it must have only been at about 2,000 feet because it's making its approach to Altus. And I could vividly see that 747 
carrying that shuttle and thinking this is the same spot where my dad was scared of the car. <laughs> How much has changed? And this was in 1980s. So that was only 70 years or so past. <laughs> Another thing, he, Grandpa uh, Henry, he, he chewed tobacco and Dad was, uh, Dad was cautioning me as I grew up. He said, uh, he said, you know, uh, I never smoked. And the reason I didn't was because I always was pestering my father when I was about 11 or 12 years old, let me chew tobacco too. And of course he never would give it to me. And so finally he got tired of me pestering him. And he says, okay, Earl. He said, but you got to do it right. Now take a big chew, chew off of this and chew it for a couple of minutes. And when it gets real juicy, take a big swallow. <laughs> and he said, of course, I got sick and, and uh, I could never stand to be around tobacco again. <laughs> Did he have um, specific chores he had to do growing up? Yeah, you know that back then there was. That's one of the things you did when you grew up. Everybody had a lot of things to do. You were busy basically from sun up to sundown, and uh, there was always cows to milk and chickens and pigs to feed. And, I remember we, we grew everything, every kind of animal that existed, it seems like that you grew on a farm, even sheep. There was always something to that. Did he ever go out on the mail route? No, but then uh, Granddad had quit uh, the mail route because they had built this Schroeder school a half a mile to the north of our homestead. My grandfather donated the land. It was on that original homesteaded land. He donated the land for the school, and they built the school there, and that must have been in the uh, early teens. Uh, the, uh, the original school adjacent to the Schroeder store was a one-room uh, school. It went to the eighth grade, and it's called Blue Goose. And so they used, that was the original schoolhouse for the community. And they outgrew that, and it must have been about 1910 or so that they built, built this new big school. It was a big one with uh, four large rooms, two on top and two on the bottom. And I've got a picture of, uh, of the, all the people that went, were in school at the time. And I, there's at least 100 to 120 people in that picture. And uh, my, my grandfather taught there for a number of years. So after he gave up the, uh, he gave up the uh, mail route, uh, he, he taught at the Schroeder School, I guess, for another 10 years or so. Hmm. That, that school only uh, went to uh, the 10th grade, and it wasn't accredited. And so uh, Dad was going to go to college, so he needed to get a high school diploma that was from an accredited school. And so he and his cousin, Riley, who was my ex's, their son, R.D. Cornett Jr., and they were the same age, and they went to, to Mangum to school, and they boarded there to get the last two years of their high school. And my father and R.D. Uh, were both superintendent of schools at Gould later on. And, uh, and R.D. Uh, eventually uh, bought the land where his father was, where Exe had grown up. He, he farmed and taught also. <laughs> and so my father and R.D. Uh, basically uh, stayed together all their lives into their 80s. They lived close to each other. 
very close. Mm -hmm. With education being important with, with your grandfather, did he encourage Earl to go to college? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, uh, there was no question that all their kids were going to go to college. And why Oklahoma A&M? Uh, because it was agricultural. Uh, they, they related to that. Uh, basically all of my family has all gone to OSU. Mm -hmm. It was like we never considered OU. <laughs> Although <laughs> my son uh, has a law degree from OU <laughs> and my uh, daughter has a nursing degree from OU. Uh, and, and it's interesting, uh, they, the, they were Republicans. My grandfather Newberry was widely known and respected in the community, but he was a Republican. And he ran for office down there but a couple of times, but never was elected. That's how strongly democratic they were. Now, X's family, they were Democrats, strong Democrats. And to this day, they, the both sides, they stay Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> my, our side stays the Republicans. <laughs> Mixed family gatherings fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they didn't really talk politics that I heard of any, but <laughs> it's, it's strange how you just accept things that your family does and without question that's what you are. Mm -hmm. At least it used to be that way. Well, after college, what did your father end up doing? My father went two years to Oklahoma A&M and then uh, in order to get enough money to keep on going to school he came back to Harmon County and, and taught in the local schools there in the uh, Dryden area one year and uh, so during that time uh, he uh, started dating my mother, who had uh, had a job as a teller in the Ewell Bank, and uh, so my my mother, uh, my father didn't think that uh, she would date him, and actually was afraid to ask her for a date, uh, but finally did at the urging of uh, one of his friends to go on a double date. And so once they had one date, that was it. They stayed together. Hey. My mother says is the first boy she let her kiss. <laughs> and, and she was, that was in 19, she was 21 years old. <laughs> and what was her name? Verl. Verl. Verl Atterbury. Okay. That, that's interesting, Verl and Earl Newberry Atterbury. Hmm. And did he ever return back to school to finish? Oh yeah, he uh, he went back uh, soon thereafter and finished his uh, bachelor's degree, and then then became a teacher at Gould, and uh, he was a teacher and a coach, and I don't know how he ever was put into a coaching position because the Newberries were never athletic and he wasn't an athlete. But he told me he, he read the books and he could understand what was important in coaching. And so he, uh, he, he became a, a very uh, winning coach. What did he coach? He coached uh, basketball. They had uh, wrestling. They had uh, football. It wasn't 12 men because there wasn't enough people. But uh, They went to state in basketball. And that's when they had to play. They went to the finals and they played Tulsa Union. And at that time they weren't classed at A, B, C. And they had to play the big schools and they, they got it in the, <laughs> the finals. Did he help out on the farm? when he returned from college and started teaching? He bought land. Okay. Uh, he, no, he didn't, he didn't, he uh, fully occupied because 
when he had such a good record coaching that uh, an adjacent school in Olusty wanted him as their coach. And they lured him away and people tried to keep him there in Gould because they said if you stay here another year or two, you'll, your principal now will, will make you superintendent. Well, my dad decided to go to Olusty. <laughs> and his team didn't win there. And they fired him after two years. <laughs> <laughs> and so he ended up as a principal in Altus and he was there for about a year and then came back to Gould as superintendent. And he was superintendent there for about five years and the school uh, burned down. Uh, one of the buildings burned down while he was superintendent. And, and my dad was always so proud that they were able to rebuild the school building, and it was a big building, contained a gymnasium and four classrooms, without going into debt. And uh, they, uh, uh, that that building is still standing. It's the only one still standing there. This is back in the mid '30s, and uh, while Dad was superintendent there, he. He built a uh, telescope, and that was one of his hobbies. And he, it was a 12-inch reflector, and he, and he did that all by hand. And that's about the maximum a human can possibly do by hand. Mm -hmm. Dad was very, very patient, and he ground that to perfection. And he uh, was. I've got pictures of that, and he said he could see the head of an L from about two miles away with that. And he he uh, went back for his master's degree at Gunnison in '39, and he didn't have money for the tuition, uh, but they were wanting you to get your master's if you were going to be an administrator, so he had to get his master's. So he went to the president of the university there in Gunnison and said, uh, I've got a, uh, a telescope and I understand you're in need of one for your astronomy classes and I'd like to trade you this telescope I made for my tuition and room and board. And so the president said, well, he says, I'll have you know I am a professional astronomer and I know what a good telescope is, so don't try to fool me with your telescope. My dad said, I'm glad to hear that. You, you'll appreciate it then. And so he was impressed with it, and so they, they made the trade. And they used that telescope in the college instruction for many years. Dad went back there in the 80s to see if it was still there, and he got a hold of one of the professors and they said, the, we don't use that anymore for astronomy, but we use it in physics, the, the lens itself, and we still use that. And so, <laughs> Dad was very pleased with that. He he made telescopes all of his life. In fact, I've got an eight-inch one. He made he made three of them for each of us boys. And uh, he donated uh, telescopes to about four universities. Very talented, very patient in that way. Well, while he's while he's you know working in education, what's happening back on the farm? There's lots of kids coming up behind him. So what's going on with grandmother and grandfather? Well, they they had uh, four other kids, and they were about two years apart, and so. They were very busy. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, they ended up getting a hired hand that lived in the house, the original house that they built. So when, when their kids left, uh, they had to have more help because Dad was, Granddad was teaching and, and acquiring more land. And so uh, 
Of course, during that time, they were getting more mechanized, and so they could do things better. And uh, then when they initially, you know, 160 acres in southwest Oklahoma, you just can't make it with 160 acres, and people found that out pretty fast. Uh, you could when the weather was right, but when you had a couple of years drought, you had problems. And one of the problems had was when, when they got there, there wasn't that many mesquites. The, 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 there was mesquites there because the cattle drives coming from South Texas spread them, spread the mesquites up through that area when they were driving the cattle up to, uh, up to Kansas. So uh, as, as the droughts hit and they, they had cattle that kept on eating and they didn't know that much about what they were doing to the grass because as you eat, eat the grass down, the roots go. So eventually you haven't got any grass and you've got bare ground and you've got uh, uh, no income. Mm -hmm. And so people would sell out. And because my grandfather was a teacher, uh, he bought up the adjacent land. And so he, uh, he, he got it up to about 800 acres wow. uh, adjacent to him. And uh, so it was pretty tough times back then. They, they had to grub out the mesquites with, the, with a team, uh, horses, mules. And Dad would talk about uh, they'd use the roots of the mesquite tree for firewood. And it, Dad said that that was just like uh, coal as far as the heat it generated because the mesquite tree is a very dense wood. So they had to clear clear the land for farming. There were mesquites there. What structures were added as time progressed? Um, they had the chicken houses in the back of the house, uh, pretty extensive chicken houses. Uh, they ran several hundred head of chicken all the time. They added a barn, a pretty good sized barn. It was a two level farm and uh, they milked cows. There was probably at least 10 stanchions there where they had cows they milked. Um, and that was pretty much it as far as any structures are in the farm. Uh, Those, those structures stayed until sometime around the uh, latter part of the 60s, and then they were torn down. Mm -hmm. And what about water? Did they dig any ponds or? They dug them with, uh, with a scoop uh, that was handled. It was pulled by a, I don't know what they called it. It wasn't a scoop per se, but they, it was pulled by a horse, and they, they dug those little small ponds, but adequate. And there was one right adjacent to the original dugout that they, they built. It's still there. It's silted in now. But uh, it was in the, uh, I guess in the 20s, uh, that they ran domestic water to the farmhouse. And uh, before that, they, they cut, caught the water off of the roof into the cistern. And the cisterns are still there. They must have made them very good because they're still in good condition. Uh, still would hold water. And uh, then uh, I guess they must have kept their gutters pretty clean because <laughs> they drank that water. And then of course they, then they, uh, they put in windmills and they put in a harsh tank, what we call a harsh tank. It was, uh, it was for watering the horses and adjacent to the, the windmill and this harsh tank was about four to five foot tall is a concrete one and it was about 15 foot long by about 10 foot wide and that was our swimming pool when I grew up and it was and it, on Sundays it was a baptismal for the local church 
they use that for their baptism, <laughs> baptism services. Uh, and that was a great little, we had a lot of fun on that, in that pond. Well, speaking about your youth, what year were you born? 1935. Okay, and are, do you have siblings? Yes, I had two brothers uh, I had, uh, that lived. I had a sister who died at four years of age from a blood disease. Uh, and, but then I had an older brother that was born two years before me who was the partner in the farm. When Dad retired in 1970, my brother, my older brother and I decided we wanted to buy the farm from him as an investment. And my younger brother, who was in the military and being moved around to different duty stations, uh, didn't think it was a thing for him to, to get involved in. So uh, many times as we experienced hard times on the farm, I thought he was the real smart one. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we uh, bought the farm from Dad when he retired and he retired, Dad retired in 1969 uh, and we bought the farm from him in 1970. And, uh, and what year did your dad get it? Dad got the farm in 1944. Okay. I've got the ledger book. When he, from Gould, he went to Martha as the superintendent. And in 1944, after he, he, put, he list, listed all of his assets and liabilities. And he figured his net worth was minus ten dollars, and he listed things even down to the radio. And he said, "You know, here I am, forty years old. I got a master's degree, and I've been superintendent for seven years, and this is my net worth. I've got to do something different." So. He, he decided to go uh, into the farming full time. So his dad was ready to retire and we went uh, to the farm from Martha. And he, he was putting in his first cotton crop. And dad hadn't been associated with cotton farming since he was uh, in high school. And he was out in the middle of the field pulling goat heads out of the cultivator in July. And it was a hundred degrees and more and the sweat bees were swarming around him. And a guy walks up to him out in the cotton field and is the local superintendent at Arnett. And he said, Earl, I want you to come and teach for me. <laughs> and Dad says, you know, I think I'll do that and let some hire somebody else to do this. <laughs> so he did. He he got a hired hand who uh, who lives uh, in a house we had uh, there, and 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 he stayed with Dad for many years, along with us boys, to farm. So in '44, the family moves to the farm. Do you move into the Sears house? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and that Sears house had the front door had this beautiful etched glass picture of Niagara Falls. Oh, it was a beautiful thing. And they were so proud of it. And my brother and I, younger brother Joe, who's I hadn't mentioned yet, two years younger than I, we got in a fight on the stairs just above where that door was. And I hit Joe or pushed him or something. At any rate, Joe went tumbling down and hit that door and broke the glass. Oh, we thought we were really going to get it. But Dad was so broken hearted, he didn't do anything but just sit there with a sad look on his face. He was. He was so disappointed that he couldn't even punish us. 
<laughs> of course, we looked pretty sad ourselves, so I guess he knew <laughs> how bad we felt. In the in the Sears house, where was your room? My brother, older brother, and I were up there in two bedrooms. The other two bedrooms, which were occupied when my dad was growing up, were just used for storage. Mm -hmm. And how was it heated? There wasn't any heating or air conditioning at all mm -hmm. uh, in the upstairs. Uh, gee, I remember many a night. Uh, of course, winter wasn't a problem. You just threw on another blanket, but you in the summertime it it was hot, and sometimes we'd get the bed out on the front porch and sleep outside because it was so hot. And I never will forget my older brother, two years older. We were both sleeping on this twin bed, and he said, "Don't put your feet on me." And of course, sometime during the night, I'd get my feet over there. So he said, we're not going to sleep this way anymore with you getting your feet on me. And he got up and got a rope and tied my feet to the bedstead. <laughs> and I let him do it. <laughs> uh. Well, growing up on the farm, you probably had chores you had to do yourself. Yeah, there was a, <laughs> yeah, I, I was driving the tractor when I was 12, 13. I remember vividly driving it. Uh, actually getting out and being by myself on the farm, doing all of that, I guess I was more like 13 or 14 before I was allowed to going out there in the field by myself, but back then you, I remember, of course I was about nine years old when we moved to the farm, so initially all I did was pull cotton and chop cotton and things like that, and uh, I couldn't wait until I was old enough to drive the tractor to get out of that. Uh, That's hard work. Uh, so. Uh, it was, you know, you, 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 I guess you grew up faster in the farm then because I was driving everything when I was 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. I was driving a school bus when I was 15. How did that come about? Well, I had taken, the, I was, I was going to be the school bus driver my junior year and I, so I'd taken training for school bus. I, I, I was fully trained and capable, and my brother was a school bus driver but couldn't drive for some reason, so I substituted for him when I was 15, and uh, got paid $25 a month for that. That's pretty good back then. Well, spending money. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about school. Where did, where did you go to school at that point? Uh, I three years in uh, Martha mm -hmm. when I was there and uh, and then uh, I was in the fourth grade I, I, I finished school there in uh, school. There's only ten in our class but it was it was a good school. How'd you get to school? It was a school bus. Okay. Uh, we lived toward the end of the route. We were we were about seven and a half eight miles from the school and so typically when uh, you, they would they couldn't hire anybody else other than the students for $25 a month and then they try to get a student who was that right age out at the end of the route so that they could so that's what happened uh, my brothers all drove it along with me <laughs> we'd get up first thing in the morning and have to milk the cows and do I feed the chicken and feed the hogs and everything, and then go ride the school bus. And then, when you came home, what was on tap? <laughs> more work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, there was always more work. Cows had to be milked every morning and evening. Pigs and chickens had to be fed. 
uh, cows had to be rounded up for milking. So there was always something to be. It was a, during a, a lot of daylight hours, we'd go out and fix fence. There, that that kept us busy. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. always a lot to do. Well, at that time, how many acres uh, did your father have? It was a uh, 990. Okay. And back then, uh, the the equipment was very small. Uh, the one ways. Uh, we used one ways back then um, with the disc and they they were only about eight foot wide and I remember we would pull down to a 160 acre field where we'd uh, plow and we'd be there with three tractors running day and night for several days uh, so it just took forever for today they pull in there and in a couple of hours they thought it. Well let's talk about harvest time. What was that like and where would you take your crop? We uh, we farmed wheat and cotton and so with the with the wheat we uh, we had our own combines. Uh, initially back in the 40s uh, the, the combine itself was it was only about six foot wide the arbor uh, and so it took forever to harvest your crop uh, and typically you had to uh, hire other people to help you do that so and the and this is before self-propelled combines these were all drag type and so my father uh, back in the uh, late 40s bought this case combine that had an auger that was a good uh, maybe 12 to 15 foot long and it was uh, a drag type and to raise and lower that auger according to the height of the wheat you, you had to raise and lower it you had to reach back and get this lever and and you would so you drove with one hand and tried to adjust the auger to the proper level well the, the, the land had terraces and some of it was rolling and so that became very difficult to do and nearly impossible to do uh, and so dad rigged up a, a seat uh, that he could sit on up where the grain bin was on the combine and he rigged up a lever next to that seat where he could adjust the auger so us boys would drive the tractor and he would adjust the auger the grain auger <laughs> <laughs> and and that worked right real good uh, and uh, except for one time <laughs> we had this we had this good wheat crop and we had a tremendous amount of rain and wind and back then the wheat a good wheat crop was you knew your wheat was good when it stood about three or four foot high and so because it was so tall the wind and rain knocked it all down and it was all laying down on the ground just laying there in a mat and and of course today a good wheat crop uh, the wheat is only a couple of foot tall uh, and they don't have that problem anymore so we we were trying to salvage that crop well to do that we had to drive very slowly and dad would get that auger uh, down as close to the ground just dragging on the ground so I was trying to be very careful because he was leaning over watching and trying not to scoop up any rocks or anything all he's trying to get the wheat save the wheat and we had this old 1928 regular farm all regular that <laughs> it didn't it it didn't have the mechanism to keep a constant speed so if you 
you hit a gully or anything, it would lurch. Well, I was driving it and doing the best I could, but I didn't see this gully, and it lurched. And Dad went flying over the reel. And I was able to stop the, the tractor before it hit him. But I thought, my gosh, Dad is really hurt bad, but he wasn't. He, he, he just got up and dusted himself off and gave me a, gave me a look. <laughs> Didn't say anything, but his look was enough. <laughs> wow. And where would you take your wheat? In Gould. Uh, they had two elevators there in Gould. At harvest time, the, it was just unbelievable. The, the, the line to the elevators of trucks was a couple blocks long. And they had two elevators. Because they didn't, the, the, the typical truck only carried like 200 bushels. And so there was a lot of trucks lined up. Back in back in the, the cotton harvest was uh, all hand pull bolts. Uh, and so it was all very hard manual labor. Uh, I never was very good with with pulling bowls because really uh, I haven't got any athletic ability and and the ones that that I would typically pull 250 pounds a, a day mm -hmm. and my buddies who were really athletic would pull maybe 400 and something pounds and because they were much more dexterous with it mm -hmm. and and that really matters a lot how athletic you are and your ability to see and, and grab bolts. Would would y'all hire some of the local kids or how? Oh yeah, everybody had to have a lot of help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you'd have, uh, you'd hire maybe 15 or 20 people, how many ever you could hire, and you got paid by the pound. And uh, <laughs> some of them, they, you'd pay them at the end of every week and uh, and they wouldn't show up for the next two, couple of days. They'd go fishing, <laughs> so you knew not to depend on them. <laughs> would you also take that to Gould? Do what? The cotton. Where would you take take the cotton? Yeah, that was that was primarily to Gould, and and sometimes to they had a gin in Russell. It was a little town to the uh, east, about four or five miles. Uh, Russell had a gin. Mm -hmm cooperative. Uh, we'd, you'd fill a, when you filled a, bag, a wagon up, that would uh, get you about a, a 450 to 500 pound bale of cotton. Let's talk about high school for you. Uh, it was a very small class for me uh, and not many subjects were available to you. you you either took vocational agriculture or took home economics. <laughs> your your options were either uh, uh, biology or trigonometry, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so uh, it was a good school. We always had great teachers. Um, typically, the a lot of the teachers were uh, local farmers. They'd grown up there, got their education, uh, and were excellent teachers. Um, and so people don't really understand the advantage of some of these small communities having that kind of talent. Uh, that uh, some of the better educated people in the county uh, teach and form. And so you get some excellent teachers. And in high school you were involved with FFA? Yes, 4-H uh, when we were younger and then uh, when you became a sophomore you, you started in vocational agriculture and, uh, and uh, 
I was president of the FFA uh, in my senior year, as were my two brothers, and uh, we were all junior master farmers. Very proud of that. Uh, that was the thing to do if you were in the rural community back then. Uh, we, we never really had any intention of farming for a living. Uh, because we grew up and knew how hard it was. <laughs> and we, we enjoyed the life, but we, we saw what my father went through and, and fortunately he had the ability to get a job and farm and had to do both of them in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Because the teacher's pay was very small and as many times uh, things were very tough on the farm, particularly in the 50s with the drought like it was. Mm -hmm. Dad had a Dad had started a Brangus herd, which is five eighths uh, Angus and three eighths Brahma, and beautiful cattle. And he had got a pretty good herd started, and we had oh at least five or six years of drought, and he had to sell all of his cattle at and at low prices. And this was, I graduated in 53, and it was a very tough time uh, because uh, basically the only way you, you survived was going to the Altus Production Credit Association back then and asking for a loan. And so that's what Dad did, and, and I, I remember many times hearing mom and dad discussing finances and how they were going to do something and how they were going to be able to make it. And, uh, and he had the income from the farm, so uh, I remember they even discussed whether I should go to college or not, uh, whether they could afford to let me go uh, or not. Uh, because they needed the help on the farm. And they didn't have the money to send me to college. Uh, but Dad said, no, he's, there's no way he's not going to go on to college right now. So, uh, fortunately, uh, I had an aunt that lived there in, in Stillwater. And uh, he, uh, she found this janitorial job for some doctors out by the hospital. And it was a good one because uh, it paid 75 cents an hour and where the normal pay for janitorial work at the college was 50 cents an hour. And I could work as many hours as I wanted to. So uh, that's the way I supported myself. Uh, oh, and, I, and I, <laughs> I got a hardship scholarship for the first semester. Sixty-six dollars, and that was what the tuition was for a semester back then, and that included all your athletic tickets too, to the football games and basketball games, everything. And uh, but sixty-six bucks was a lot back then, so uh, Dad was. We were real tickled to get that money, and and so Dad told me, said, "Now, Max, he says you think Dr. Wilhelm." for that. Uh, okay, Dad. Well, here an old country kid there at big campus. And how do you get to see the president of the university or the college and thank him for it? So it bothered me for there for several months. I hadn't done what I told my dad I'd do. So <laughs> I said, yeah. So I said, I got to figure out some way to see the, the president. And one day, I'm walking up the steps of the student union, and Dr. Wilhelm's walking down. And I stick out my hand and I said, Dr. Wilhelm, I just want to express my appreciation for the scholarship. And of course, he didn't know what I was talking about. And, he kind of, I, and then he recovered real fast and he said, well, you're welcome, son. <laughs>
How did you get to A&M at that point? How, what was your traveling like? We bummed rides with uh, people that had cars that lived in the vicinity. Okay. We, uh, I had, uh, I had a brother, John, who was two years ahead of me in, in college, and he uh, lived in that village. He was married, and they had the, the old temporary buildings out there on the uh, west side of the campus that they put there from the World War II for the veterans. And they called it Vet Village and uh, it cost uh, $45 a month for your, it was a two bedroom, living room, kitchen, bath, and, uh, and utilities for $45. Well, my brother worked as a poultry major and worked on the poultry farm for 50 cents an hour and he could buy eggs for a penny apiece and so he and one of his poultry majors had a this old garage and they hatched some eggs and raised chickens and so since he still couldn't afford the $45 I left the dormitory after I was in Cardell I left the dormitory after one semester and moved in with him since I couldn't afford the dormitory. And so I lived with he and his wife and and under one year old kid. <laughs> it wasn't good set up for either one of us. And but and his wife Wanda was uh, very resourceful. Uh, she seemed like she had a hundred different ways to cook eggs and chicken <laughs> because that's about all we ate was eggs and chicken. <laughs> and what was your major at A&M? Industrial Engineering. Now why did you decide to go into engineering? Uh, well, I always liked mechanical things and I was halfway decent in, uh, in math and those sorts of things and I heard they made good pay so I really didn't know anything about the different engineering disciplines mm -hmm. and so I initially started out to be an electrical engineer and after I took my first course in electrical engineering I decided I've got to change majors because I don't like this <laughs> and so I, by that time I'd found out about uh, industrial engineering and management Mm -hmm. And so, after you graduated, what happened? What came next? I graduated with a uh, with a commission in the Air Force, uh, and you were obligated to uh, serve for three years. And so I uh, qualified uh, for. Well, I took. I took. I wanted to be a pilot. But they gave me a, a, an aptitude test where they gave you different situations and orientations, and I failed that. I couldn't tell whether I was upside up or down, and I think, think it's a good thing to flunk me out of, not put me into flight school. And so they said, well, you could be a navigator since you've got the background in math and everything for that. Well, that was a five-year obligation, and I said, I will spend five years telling somebody where they're going. And they said, well, you can be a meteorologist. Well, that really appealed to me because my dad's brother had been a meteorologist in the Second World War. And, uh, in fact, ran uh, did flights over Japan in preparation for the atomic bomb drop. He didn't know it, but that's what he was doing. And he... <laughs> He was volunteering for every mission. Of course, they were shooting at him, but every mission that come up, whether it says or not, he'd volunteer for it because you got so many points, you got to go back home. And and he was engaged to this lady, and he wanted to get back home. <laughs> and the day after his last flight, they dropped a bomb, and so. <laughs> to any rate, uh, I got interested in that uh, and went to Texas A&M for a year, study meteorology. And then I 
at, at the time the Air Force uh, forecasted the weather for the Army and they assigned me to Fort Sill uh, to do the forecasting, which I was a bachelor at the time and it didn't bother me so much. I, it was close to home and I was dating this girl. So I wasn't disappointed to be that close to home while I was still a bachelor because I was dating her. Of course, as would happen, about a month later we broke up. <laughs> what year did you graduate from A&M? 58. At that time, uh, it took five years because the, the ROTC was 20 hours and to get a degree in uh, engineering uh, with ROTC is a I had a total of 168 hours in the five years. It was always she by then. Yeah. Yeah. Would you go back home at all during that period and work, help out on the farm? Yeah, I, I would when I didn't have summer work as a as an engineering trainee. Mm -hmm. I'd go back home and work. I would uh, do that, and I would. Uh, uh, we bought a truck. Uh, I bought a 48 Dodge. This is in 54. First year I stayed in at OSU and or Oklahoma A&M and worked the worked the uh, worked the clinic job because I they had I had to have that job and so I had to work through the summer to keep the job. So I I took a course, two courses during the summer that first year and this is a little bit of a side but this course was taught by a excellent teacher called Square Root Smith. He was actually Dr. Smith but he was a southern gentleman and but he gave tough test and he got his name by of Square Root. <laughs> he, he averaged passing the square root of his class. I mean he <laughs> saw so, we, there was about 25 of us that came to class that first day and there's supposed to be another professor teaching the course. Well, something happened that teacher couldn't teach it, so they assigned Dr. Smith. Well, he walks in, and as soon as he walks in, half the class got up and walked out. His reputation was that much. And the rest of us stayed for the hour and then got together and we said, he's going to flunk. There won't be more than two of us past the course. And there's already two math majors in the course. <laughs> so we said, we got to drop the course. So we all went up in mass with our drop cards to the head of the math department. And he says, you guys come back tomorrow and we'll, we'll talk this over. So we came back the next day and the head of the department was there along with Dr. Smith and, and uh, he said, it's my understanding that you have no problems with Dr. Smith as a teacher. Is that right? No, no problems. It's that you're concerned about the hardness of his test. Is that right? Yeah. He said, well, we have taken a study of everybody that's taken the course under every teacher for the past 10 years and we have got a spread and that's the spread we'll apply to this class. Two of you will get A's, two of you will fail, one or two will get D's and blah blah blah. So if y'all accept that, we'll go ahead. So we did. <laughs> what did you get? Oh I got a C. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was tickled to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I had, there, there was there's only one there was two math majors and a couple others that were just we we the majority of the class got C's. <laughs> At what point did you did you think you know as time goes on and you're you're in your career and that you're gonna go back and buy that farm? I didn't until uh, I was 
close to I don't think I really ever really thought about buying the farm or getting back to the farm but when dad made the decision to sell the farm my brother and I decided it was a real good investment and so we we decided to partner in it and at the time I was working for General Electric uh, in Chicago I'd, 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 when I got out of the Air Force I went back to OSU and got my master's in industrial engineering and then went to work for GE and uh, worked for him on a training program for three years and, and which involved uh, Louisville and Schenectady and, and uh, Cincinnati and, uh, and I ended up in, as a manager of facilities and advanced manufacturing engineering activities and or Hot Point which is part of GE and, and Cicero and uh, it was that time that my dad decided to retire and uh, he decided he wanted to sell the farm and he needed $450 a month to supplement his teacher retirement and Social Security and so he said I want to sell it uh, for and I want the the note for it for 20 years and so I got on the primitive computer at work and this was really <laughs> back this is 1970 oh it was a very primitive computer but uh, I knew how to work computers and uh, and I ran the program to see what the amortization schedule was and uh, so that's the way we developed the price uh, for the farm. So it's it's interesting to note when so we agreed on the price uh, which at the time was 990 acres and is about ninety thousand dollars and uh, along with that came uh, shares in two oil companies, royalty companies, Panhandle Royalty and Farmers uh, Cooperative, uh, which Granddad Newberry Henry had traded 40 acres of land for one share of the stock. So he ended up with uh, three shares of Farmers stock and one share of Panhandle. And that had been passed down to through the family, to my dad when my dad bought the farm, and then uh, when dad sold the farm to us, he gave us the shares, and my brother and I split the shares up, and I ended up with one share of Panhandle and one share of Farmers, and my brother John ended up with two. Well, at the time, the stock was worth twenty-five dollars a share, and paid a couple of dollars dividends and so nobody thought much about it well <clears throat> things have changed and and uh, farmers now the stock is worth a hundred thousand dollars for that original share and the and the I, I sense uh, I sold the panhandle shares at uh, hundred and eighty thousand dollars and the reason I know it's worth $25 when I filled out my income tax I had to call up and see what they were selling for back in the 70s <laughs> and they said $25 well when I gave that information to my accountant he didn't believe it you know and he says you made a mistake there and I said no <laughs> went from $25 to 180000 <laughs> and today it's double that <laughs> uh, because they've they've really done great did your your father keep the mineral mineral rights on this property? Yes. Yes. And they, did they ever do any drilling or? Never did uh, drill. Uh, they have drilled within a couple of miles, um, and they would lease periodically and do seismic work there periodically, but uh, never drilled. And it's interesting. 
that they rarely ever, they leased, typically I leased some of the land back in the 1980s for $25 in five years. And then there hadn't been any leasing since then until two years ago. They leased, they offered me a lease for $200 an acre, three sixteenths for three years, and with the ability, if, if they wanted to, to release it for the same amount for two additional years. That lease is not expired yet, so I don't know if they're going to, but they, they haven't, <laughs> and they've leased up all of Harmon County, basically, all the southern part, but they haven't drilled any wells. Hmm. Uh, they've got some problems with the pipelines and things like that, I understand. But, you know, somebody, somebody asked me, well, Max, have you got any oil on your land? And I said, oh, yeah. And the guy that knew me looked at me and I said, they just hadn't found it yet. <laughs> Well, in the 1970s, you're, you, you have ownership of this property. Are you still out of state? No, I, I decided I, I, I stayed out of state for another year or so, and then I decided I wanted to get back to Oklahoma. My brother was living in Dallas. He was, uh, he was a pilot for American Airlines and, in Dallas, and he was uh, managing it. Uh, the farm. Uh, we had leased it to a boyhood friend of ours and he did the farming, a guy that we really trusted and knew to take good care of the land and we went in partnerships with him and 50-50. And uh, so my brother managed it for three years until uh, I got a job uh, uh, with Star Manufacturing and moved back here, moved into this house in 1974. So I got back and uh, and my brother says, Max, he said, I've been managing the farm for three years. It's your turn to do it for three years. Well, 30 something years later, I was still doing it. <laughs> my brother really didn't care much for getting involved in it. He, he turned that any finances over to his wife. <laughs> well, let's talk about changes um, during your ownership. You probably saw quite a bit in terms of not only um, your crops and livestock, but also weather and the economy. The uh, it had completely changed from the time when I grew up on the farm to the way things were handled uh, even in the in the 70s uh, and significantly changed since then of course uh, but the when I got back involved in it I truly didn't feel competent in in the farming as such because I'd been away from it so long. I knew about it but things had changed so much. They, the, the way they went about harvesting the uh, harvesting the cotton all mechanized. The way when I grew up you chopped the weeds in the cotton. They called it cotton chopping. I heard some people actually didn't know any better and chopped the cotton when they went in. <laughs> but, you know, and, and of course today they, they use chemicals uh, to get rid of the weeds and everything. Uh, they fly everything over in planes. We did have some chemical spraying, but we would do it on a spray rig attached to a tractor to spray for insects, but not for, not for weeds. We didn't have pre-emergence back then like they do and uh, with no no ability to mechanically harvest other than back in the late or the early 50s they were doing some sort of uh, 
sled pulling kind of mechanisms to to do cotton harvest. But uh, by the time I got back to the farm, uh, it was twenty something years later, and they no longer used one ways; they used the chisels uh, for the land, uh, and the the equipment was so much bigger and so much more expensive that the farms were much bigger. Uh, when we bought the land from Dad, it was 990 acres, and my brother and I felt like it was a good investment, so we added uh, about another 800 acres to it, and adjacent land adjacent to the original kinds of things. So it, it, it was necessary to do those things. Everybody was doing that. Uh, we did it because we thought it was good investment, good buy. Uh, that was in the late 70s, early 80s, and back then it was it was price of price of the land, which this was pasture land and crop land together, uh, was somewhere around $400 an acre. Well. And, and the interest rate was something like 7 or 8% with Federal Land Bank. And it wasn't but a couple of years later after we had made some sizable investments in land that that changed. <laughs> <laughs> and did it change? It, the interest rates went to 13%. And uh, so the, at the time, uh, the interest on the farm was actually more than I was making as for my job as an engineer. Uh, and so we kept borrowing money. And finally the Federal Land Bank said, when I called up for the next loan to pay, <laughs> to go another year, they said, uh, no more loans. <laughs> we've, we've loaned you to your full extent. And so that was rather disturbing uh, because that came at a time with which the payment was due within about a month. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, my father had saved up money and, and he began loaning us some money and he could get better interest rates from us than he could from his investments. So it worked out good for both of us and we were able to survive those high interest rates and, and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but at one point in time, uh, we we became uh, necessary to to sell a piece of land because we couldn't make the payment. Uh, my brother actually, uh, I, I came up with my part of the money, but my brother couldn't. Uh, he was an airline pilot, but in making good money and and was had other activities. But one of his activities was developing land. Well, when everything went sour financially, so did his land development business, and so he had to, the bank recalled his note on his development project, which is pretty sizable, and so there for a year or so, he couldn't make payments. Well, the only way we could do it was to set up some land and for sale, mm -hmm. and so I never will forget that we had this, uh, we had this, I picked out the lands that were away from the original farm stead that would best get rid of and I, we had our cell and it was at a community building there in Gould and there's two pieces of land and the auctioneer had given me an estimate on what they were bringing and so forth and he's up there going through his banner and I'm thinking, yep, 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 I'm getting some bids. And then a couple of minutes go by and he stops and waves at me to come up. And he said, uh, Max, he says, I'm going to close down the auctioning on this piece of land. And I said, why? We're getting good bids on it. He said, we haven't got a bid yet. 
He said, I've just been acting like we've been getting bids, trying to get people to see where they were. But we haven't got a bid yet. And it's about 20% below what we estimated. He said, we'll go on to this other piece of land. Well, the same thing happened with it. Uh, people were really looking for bargains, and, uh, and we couldn't get enough money to even pay back the federal land bank, so uh, we just called the sale off. And I went back to, to the Federal Land Bank, and they said, well, we'll restructure the note. And uh, so, of course, they did, but they increased the interest rate. <laughs> so, but we were, we were able to recover from that. My brother was able to recover from his problem and make his payments. Hmm. So we kept everything. It was tough times. Oh, yeah. What was your, how did your father feel about what was going on? Uh, this was at a point in time, I'm trying to remember, my father died in 93 and uh, he, he, he'd gone through the same kinds of things and he understood it. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he, he was well familiar with what I was going through, <laughs> so he commiserated with me. <laughs> but he, we borrowed about all of his money too. <laughs> well, you you sold the property in two thousand seven. Yeah. The centennial year. Centennial year was two thousand. It was in two thousand. Oh, was it centennial of the state? Yeah, of the state of the state. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, was that a hard decision to make? Emotionally, it was, uh, because I, I, I loved that farm, uh, been part of my life, and I, I was, I had, uh, since the late 70s, I had been working on the farm removing trees, the mesquite trees. Uh, we had a lot of mesquites and we, uh, we bought this old dilapidated antique crawler tractor that my brother had found in Texas that some construction company uh, got rid of because they didn't want to fool with it anymore. It was built in the late 40s and so it was all mechanical. Well, we got it for $2,500, and my brother hauled it up from Dallas to the farm, and I met him there at the farm. And I'd never been on a crawler tractor. And so I said, well, John, do you know how to drive this thing? And he says, well, I've done it once. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you do it? And so he got up there and showed me this pull that lever to go this way and push on the brake and that and so I said okay let me try it so I got up there and of course I was all concerned I'd run into something but he gave me a five minute lesson and said I gotta get back to Dallas well that was the last time my brother was ever on that tractor we were supposed to be a joint project to run the tractor and get kill him get to grub out the mesquite trees so, at any rate, I find there's a local farmer there that had uh, good, good mechanical capabilities and a good farm shop, James Masters. And I took the tractor over to James and I said, James, I want you to fix this thing up for grubbing. And he rigged up the grubber blade for the tractor and put on, this is a shovel type tractor, and he put on the cleats on the tractor, welded on the cleats and put a steel cab on top of it to give sun protection as well as the limbs from the mesquite trees. And so, like I say, it's a shovel tractor and it turns out this was only a 50 horsepower tractor, two cylinder tractor, small one. And so I take it out and I don't know how to grub mesquite trees. So I get out there and, and start 
trying to figure out how to grub out the mesquite trees. Well, after a couple of hours, I figured out how to pull them out okay. And so I'm out there, and a day or so later, James comes by to see how I'm doing. And I've pulled out quite a few trees, and he says, i got to tell you, Max, all that time I was fixing up this tractor, he said, I've grubbed mesquite trees out with a lot of equipment, bigger than this. And, and I was sure this tractor wouldn't do it. <laughs> but the reason it was able to do it is because it had that hydraulic mm. shovel lift. And you get that blade in underneath. You'd go in just before, about two feet before the root of the tree. And you'd get that blade about two feet underneath the ground and grab a hold of the root and then pull on the hydraulics and that would yank the tree out along with the forward motion of the tractor. But it would only do that, I found, when it was wet. If it was dry, then the tree would snap off. If the tree would snap off, then the next year you would just have this bush and you'd have a bigger problem with it than you had before. So you learned to only go down there when it was wet to pull out the trees. And I did that all myself. I'd go down there on the weekends. And I'd leave Friday afternoon, get down there that evening, and work uh, until the sun went down. And then I'd work until Sunday, until the sun went down. And I'd drive back home and I'd camp out down there. And it's so nice, you know, you'd be tired and so nice to sit out there and, and enjoy the night light and see all the stars and everything. And, uh, so I did that for about 15, 20 years and I, I, I actually grubbed out about a square mile of mesquite trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> the, old, the old tractor finally wore out about the same time I did. <laughs> and I, I kept that old tractor running. I didn't know anything about diesel or crawler tractors, but I sure learned a lot. Uh, you know, when you're growing up on the farm, you you, you got to be able to take care of yourself. You got to. Mm -hmm. There's nobody there to help you. You're out in the middle of the field, and and uh, nobody there to help you. So we always took a pair of pliers and bailing wire when I was growing up. Never. Never went to the field without a pair of pliers and bailing wire. Fix most things with that, like you can with WD-40 today. <laughs> but uh, when I went there grubbing you know, that, there's nobody around there anymore. You know, Schroeder, the closest house to Schroeder is like four or five miles away nobody around there. And the nearest town where you can, as Google is eight miles and there's, it hardly exists as a town anymore. So the nearest town is Mangler and Hollis, 18 miles away. And when I was doing that, I was, my wife was always concerned because I'm out there by myself and this is before cell phones. And if something had happened to me, she wouldn't have known about it until I didn't come back Sunday evening. So we were real tickled when finally cell phones came back. <laughs> I could call. Well, there are, there are a couple of things I want to I want to ask you about um, holidays. What were holidays like on the farm? I don't remember holidays on the farm. <laughs> You know, other than firecrackers, mm -hmm. that's the only and Christmas, of course. Mm -hmm. But other than those, Thanksgiving, you know, every day was the same as the farm work had to be done. There wasn't any change in that. So, it wasn't a day off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did get Sundays off. My family was very religious and. We never worked on Sundays other than things that just had to be done, feed the cattle and milk the cows. 
during harvest we would uh, dad would harvest during on Sunday the wheat harvest but other than that uh, Sundays were free and uh, we would uh, get to go to Hollis and see the show we would I remember we when I was younger and not old enough to drive would leave church in Gould I would leave they mom and dad would go back to the farm and I would hitchhike from Gould to Hollis you, you'd always catch a ride right away so and everybody hitchhiked those days and it was a real treat for me because I got to go to the restaurant and order a chicken fried steak meal and, and go to the movie and then I'd hitchhike back for evening services at church. <laughs> well speaking of food, did you have any any favorite meals? Well, it chicken most of the time and it was always good because uh, it was fresh. We would we raised our own chicken and, and chicken had been killed that morning and uh, we we always ate good. Uh, you know, we raised our pigs and, and cattle. And, uh, we always had meat every meal. Uh, we had fresh eggs. I ate, I ate some fresh eggs the other day and they taste entirely different from what you get at the store. And I forgot what good. And the, of course the milk we had ourselves and it was always fresh. And But I never got to eat, drink milk with uh, cream in, uh, with uh, butter fat because she'd all uh, would always skim off the off the cream and I would churn it make the butter back then you'd crank it to, for the paddle to, to make the butter so we we always drank skim milk is less than one percent I'm sure of that <laughs> did she have a specialty she was just really good at she was a good cook uh, period. Uh, rolls were great. I remember her rolls being great and she was just, you know, I, I think most farm ladies are good cooks. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the, we had chicken a lot. Of course, we had, well, we had meat all the time, but I, with, with that, he liked the white meat, the breast and the thigh, the wishbone. And we knew better than to touch those, but Mom would always put them on his plate anyway. <laughs> I don't think I knew what a uh, breast bone tasted like until I left the farm. <laughs> Whose job was it to uh, kill the chickens? Everybody has a technique too. I'm interested in the technique as well. Well, Mom didn't want to kill chickens. When, even back in Martha, when we had chicken, we, we dad raised chickens even when he was superintendent of schools. And mom would have us take the chickens across the street to this lady who would wring their necks. And so my brother and I decided one time that it wasn't necessary to do that, that we could kill the chicken. Of course, we were all of see I was six and he was eight and we decided we could string that chicken up and so we put a string around its neck and put it over a limb and pulled it up and of course it wasn't working and the chicken was squawking like crazy and <laughs> mom came out and rescued the chicken for a few minutes anyway <laughs> so that was the end of that but mom never could would kill a chicken uh, my grandmother had no problem. She would just take that chicken's head and wring it. I seen her do that. Or then she got to where she would take a hatchet and she had a chopping block, chopped her head off. And that, uh, my brother and I were very inventive about how to kill chickens, and we got a bow and arrow set and decided that was the way you should do it. My parents put a quick stop to that too. <laughs> I 
I don't think mother ever got over her inability to kill the chicken. Hmm. Well, it sounds like you and, and your brothers were quite inventive. What else did you do for fun around the farm growing up? Oh, we had a lot of, we had a horse and uh, we bought this horse at a sale as a young one. It was during a drought period and it was skin and bones. And we paid $25 for it. And when I was, and the saddle cost $50. We didn't. We rarely used the saddle unless we were going to ride a long time, because it's just too much trouble. So we'd ride bareback. Well, when we got the horse, I was only about nine or ten years old, and my brother's only twelve. So we weren't old enough to break the horse. We had a guy that's eighteen years old living a half a mile from us, and so we got him to come down and break the horse. And so. He got the horse where it wouldn't buck, and so I'm going to get on the horse, and I'd never ridden the horse before. And so I get on the horse and said, giddy up. And the horse got scared, because I didn't know how to, and started running. <laughs> Ran, and, and it was a half a mile he kept running until he finally stopped at a fence and I was hitting mesquite trees and limbs and, I, and anyway that was my first experience riding a horse and but we would ride that on Sundays and whenever we could to go around see friends and that sort of thing. One time we had this mule that got in our pasture and had been there for a year or two and so finally the owner of the mule came by and said uh, Earl I know my mule has been in your pasture for a long time and I should have come and got it. said, how about me just giving you that mule for the pasture? And Dad said, well, okay. <laughs> so we had us a mule. Didn't know what to do with it. Didn't have any use for it. So us boys decided uh, it had snowed. And so us boys decided we had this old sled that was used as a cultivator by my granddad. And it had the blades on the side of the wooden structure that he used to pull behind a horse. That's the way he cultivated back then. And it had lain out there by the barn. Well, we said, we took the blades, the steel blades off that cut the weeds, and we rigged it up behind that mule. And so we're having fun going out there with that mule pulling us on that sled until we did something that spooked the mule and that mule took off and we went flying one way and the mule and the sled went off the other and I never will forget that old mule running with that sled behind it and it's scaring him more and more and the sled hitting the terraces and bouncing. <laughs> so, that, uh, that was our last adventure with that mule, I think. And Dad got rid of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had to... Back, uh, they washed with these old Ringer washing machines with the Maytag motor, single cylinder. Well, when they finally got rid of... They got the, the modern ones. You could get these old Maytag motors for a dollar. They were just sitting around everywhere. Well, we found this little uh, Cushman frame that used to be a Cushman motor bike. This is back when the Cushman was, uh, was the moped of the day. And so it didn't have a motor. So we got this Maytag motor and put on this Cushman frame. And it didn't have enough power to get going, even though we were only about 13, 14, it didn't weigh that much. So to get it going, we'd get it on the cellar and get some momentum. And once you had some momentum going, you could, you could have fun with that. <laughs> and then we, we this back in, is around 1950, we, we bought two Model A's for $25 a piece. And... 
uh, neither one of them were running. And so my brother and I, John, uh, made one out of the two and, you know, salvaged the parts. And I really didn't, I was only about 14, 13, 14, and I wasn't near as good mechanically as my brother. I was a step and fetch it basically, and, and uh, oh, we had fun with those old Model A's, because you could, you could, with the Model A, you had what they call a spark advance. When you, when you started a Model A, you needed to advance that, that distributor so that you'd get the good, strong spark. And so, once it was running, you, you didn't need your spark advance. But we found out if you jerked that thing up and down, you could make it backfire because it, it'd fire at the wrong time. <laughs> and so you'd have a big explosion and it'd go boom. And of course we didn't have a muffler. And that was just the biggest, it's like a shotgun. And we'd go to town and do that at, at midnight. <laughs> and, I'm sure we were doing terrible damage to that motor, but we were having so much fun. We finally we used that for a lot of a lot of fun. Just you know, and it, it finally quit working because the, the radiator sprung so many leaks it, it drowned out the motor. <laughs> We'd have to put a fill it. In the eyes. But, Would you ever get in trouble for your mischief? <laughs> well. In school, we, our class, oh, boy, class had a reputation for mis being mischievous. Uh, we even had a contest to see who could get the most licks. And it, it was a mark of pride who was ahead. Mm. And this is when we was in the ninth grade. Just mischievous stuff, aggravating the teachers. And they freely used the paddle back then. You did anything. And, talk back or anything. Out came the paddle. <laughs> and so it was it was a mark of distinction who had the most and we kept track. And so the teacher finally, the principal found out about it, what was happening. And so he called us together and he says, New rules, no more whippings. No more whippings. I'm not going to whip you guys anymore. Really? No. You don't go out for baseball. <laughs> Do anything bad. You're out for baseball for a week. Man, we were like little angels from the <laughs> That would do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I remember one time my, my brother and John and I got into it and 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 he ended up hitting me with a two before. And I was afraid. He's two years older, and so I was afraid of him. And I was afraid to fight back. But I grabbed the two before and went running to Mama. And I got got up to the house and tell him. And John's coming tagging along behind, and going to defend himself. He's going to listen to what I'm saying. He's going to defend himself why he did it. And so he's standing there, and I'm telling him, and he took that two before and hit me. And I saw him there, and I took the two before, just like this. And I went, plant. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom decided we were even. <laughs> well, if you got hurt, would you see the doctor or sick or? No, not really. Uh, he pretty, pretty well was doctored there at home. I remember one time I was making some candy, trying to help his mother, and I got it was sticky, and I got the spoon and pulled it and splashed it out on my hand. Burned it pretty bad. I had to go to the doctor for that. But oh, did you have home remedies or? Yeah, they had a lot of castor oil and black draw. It was one time we were 
when you when you pull cotton, then you, you pull cotton for each other and that sort of thing. If you if your cotton crop was pulled, so ours was pulled, and so we went over to the Canuts where my grandmother was homesteaded, and uh, so we we were pulling. My brother and I were pulling the uh, cotton there and we finished up about midday. Well, it was a mile to walk back home. And, but they had a telephone there. They had party lines back there. And so we knew if we used the phone, this one lady always listened and they were still pulling her cotton. And we knew if we called back home, that lady was going to be listening. And she was liable to get in on it. So we finally decided we were just too lazy to walk back home. We'd, we'd risk it. So we called and said, Mama, we're through pulling cotton for the Canuts. Uh, would you come and get us? And about that time, this lady's name was Eva. Eva got on the phone. Verl, they can come over to our place and pull. It was only quarter mile away. Okay boys go over there. <laughs> so we go over there and we're really upset. They're having to keep on pulling cotton. So we figured let's get sick. That way we can go home. So we told them call call mama dad come get us we're sick. Both of you? Yeah, it must have been something we ate. So, Dad comes and picks us up. Says, you boys both sick, are you? Yeah, must have been something we ate, Dad. Well, he could tell we weren't sick. And he says, well, you know, if you, your stomach's upset, what you need is a good dose of castor oil and back draw. Said, that's what fix you up. And, of course, we couldn't. We wouldn't tell him well, we're not really sick, so he gave us a big dose of that. And of course, we were really sick then. <laughs> That'll make you sick. Yeah. That was the remedy for most things, is to purge your body. How did um, bookkeeping change through the years? Can you recall your father keeping books, or...? Uh, I, I'm sure he did, but I, I haven't got anything other than the ledger that, where he kept some books and that, that wasn't extensive. Uh, and I haven't got a lot of records. Uh, I know he must have because I know I kept extensive records, uh, for all the financial matters and, uh, uh, very extensive records. Did he trust the banks? He was a director of, of the... Uh, yeah, he trusted them. Uh, it was... Uh, my mother was a teller in the mm -hmm. bank. Uh, and her... She was a teller because her uh, brother-in-law was officer in the, along with his brother, they owned the bank in Gould. And this is a kind of an interesting story, you know, they, back then the, the banking was completely different uh, and they kept all the books by hand and you had, she should tell the story about you had to balance the books at the end of the day to, and if you were missing one penny you had to it didn't balance. You had to stay there an hour or two to find out where that penny was. So, when she was, mother died when she was 98, and when she was 95, she she said, Max, I'm going to tell you a story about what happened in the bank that I was sworn to secrecy, but I want you're the first one I can tell you. Now, this was 70 years later after the incident. She said, it was at the end of the day, 
the bank was doors were shut and Russell who was her brother-in-law said he and his brother Herman who were the co-owners got in an argument about a loan they had made and they had a disagreement about it to the point to where they got in a fist fight and they were hitting each other all over the bank and finally they got settled and Russell came over to mom and said, Verl, what happens at the bank stays in the bank. <laughs> she said, I've kept it a secret for 70 years. <laughs> Did she continue her career uh, in banking or did she stay home and, well, and raise the family? Well, it wasn't career per se. No, she was fully occupied on the farm. I mean, she, I, yeah, I figured with she she did all of the. Uh, she was one of the busiest ones, uh, doing all the cooking and everything, and uh, running to town for this and that and everything, and bringing meals when we were out in the field. She'd bring meals to us. I remember. One time I was, we had this one quarter section of land that was 12 miles from our, from our home and I was plowing and she brought me uh, lunch. And so I ate my lunch and then I had to go out there and there's an old John Deere tractor and the tractor was one that used to have a starter motor on it. So it had uh, teeth on the flywheel which you cranked to start it. And so it was very rough. And once the generator and, and the went out, they just yanked them off and you kept hand cranking it. Well, that tractor wouldn't start. And I remember cranking on that thing for 30 minutes before I got that thing to start. And I was just I was in excellent shape to able to crank that thing because it was hard to crank. But I never will forget how I was so tired and so give out that I was actually crying. I think I was about 15 or 16. But those old John Deere tractors were something else sometimes to start. And we were young and didn't know how to fix things where they would start. So. He just kept on trying to crank and crank until something happened. <laughs> Did your mom, uh, was she involved in any home demonstration clubs? My grandmother was, but I don't think they had those sorts of things uh, that mom was involved in. Uh, but I, I distinctly remember that my grandmother and her group would get together once a week at the teacherage where the old Schroeder school was and they had what they called a quilting bee with a big frame and they'd all sit around and do their quilting and that was their social outlet for the you know the, that was the day they looked forward to. Of course, they, they kept up, they kept up with things with the, the, the party line and the telephone. Line. There was about. I remember they would meet in in our house, uh, once a year, and decide what needed to be done to the party line because they were responsible for the maintenance. That was their line. Uh, no company or anything did the work. Uh, so they'd allocate, uh, they'd allocate the work that had to be done to keep it up and they would uh, whatever money was needed and uh, I still remember the telephone number was 1602F2. You had the crank telephone and uh, you, your crank, the, the length of time you cranked it would be a short crank or a long crank. A short crank would just be about one turn and a long crank would be two or three turns. And ours was two longs. And uh, so everybody had uh, had their had their number of rings and uh, 
he knew who was calling, who was getting the call, and uh, it was just accepted, I guess, that you picked up the line and listened because everybody did it. <laughs> Several ladies in particular would always do it, and they and they would butt in on the t conversation, <laughs> just like they were being called. <laughs> Did you have any interactions through the years with county agents? Yeah, yeah, they were in part of, uh, back then. Everybody used them extensively for their knowledge. Yeah, I remember them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, they, I don't know if they called them the county agent at the time, but uh, I, I used them extensively when I was farming for their knowledge give me advice. Uh, a lot of the land, I say a lot, some of the land that uh, we had wasn't as good for farming crops and back in, they had the soil conservation program back in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, when, when us boys uh, graduated from high school, their dad was without any assistance on the farm and he didn't really want to have to keep up with it anymore. He was getting in his 60s and so he put a lot of the land in the soil bank which uh, really worked out great for him because by doing that it, it paid for his debt service and uh, he was able to go ahead and teach and so when uh, when we uh, got the farm, we some of that land he had put in the soil bank. This is in '73, and as it so happened, we had great rain that year, and that land had laid fallow for so long, 20 years or so, that it was just fertile as could be, and we got 50 bushel wheat off of some of it. And which was very significant back then when the average was 15 to 20. And uh, so we had about 10,000 bushels of, uh, of wheat. And so we were there. We, my brother and I, I came down from Chicago and we, and he came up from, Dal from Dallas and we were, we were doing all the farming ourselves at the time. We were hiring people to plow it and that sort of thing. And so we came up for the harvest to get the harvest in, and we put it all in the grain bins and stored it because somebody had told Dad that Russia was having a bad wheat harvest and that they thought it was the grain operator in Enid. Um, and he told Dad, he says, I think wheat's going to go up in price. So at the harvest time, I'm talking to this local farmer, and I said, what are you going to do with your wheat crop? He said, you kidding? I'm selling it. He said, it's $2.50, and that's twice as much it was last year. He said, I've never gotten $2.50 for my wheat. I'm selling it. So back in my mind, I'm thinking, that said the wheat price is going up. And that guy knows something. So we just stored it. And so I go back to Chicago and my brother goes back to Dallas to fly. And so I'm getting the Wall Street Journal and keeping tabs on the futures and everything. And the thing is going up 20 cents a bushel a day. Mm. And so, and this is in December. And so my brother calls him Dallas and says, do you realize the price of wheat is $4 a bushel? And I said, yeah. He says, you ready to sell it? And I said, don't sell any of it. It's going to keep on going up. He says, are you sure? And I said, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's what I think. So sure enough, it got up to $5. And toward the end of December. And so I called my brother up. And I said, we got a tax problem now if we sell it all. So let's sell half of it now and then... As soon as January turns around, we sell the other half. So that's what we did. And so we got $50,000 from that wheat crop. 
and uh, which was more than half of what the farm cost. <laughs> Lots of ups and downs. Yeah, that was the last good year too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like like the uh, local farmer down there says, Max, you better enjoy it because you probably never see another one. He was right. Well, the 80s were, were rough too. Oh, were you... gee, were they? Not only the, the interest rates, but everything. Yeah. Hmm. Tough. But, you know, that's farming. It's poor guys down there in the southwest. Yeah, I, I sold the farm in 2007. I, I wasn't looking to sell it. But this local real estate guy who lived in Russell but ran his office out at Altus calls me up and said, Max, he said, uh, I think I can get a buyer for your land. And I said, well, I'm not ready to sell it. I'm not interested in selling it. He says, well, if I could get the right price, would you sell it? And I said, sure. And he says, well, you don't mind me looking for somebody to buy it, do you? I said, no, you're welcome to try it. But so he comes back and he says, I think I got somebody that I can sell it to. And I think I can get uh, maybe $400 an acre. And he says, how's that sound? And I couldn't believe it because I wasn't expecting more than $300, $325 for that land down there because it wasn't, it was mostly pasture land and at any rate, uh, and the land prices were, weren't that great. And I, so I said, well, let me think about that. So I got to looking into it and I found out that land was actually selling for around $450 to $500 an acre. And so I told him, I said, uh, you know, I educated myself a little bit on the price of land, and I think that's too low. <laughs> he said, oh, you looked it up, did you? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, I'll see what else I can do. So about a year or so goes by, and, and he's, I said, oh, you know, I don't really have to sell it. and don't necessarily want to sell it. But if you can get the right price, so make a longer story shorter, uh, I ended up getting seven hundred dollars was some or some of it. Oh, I sold it all at one time. Mm -hmm. But that was with I had to sell the minerals with some of that. I kept half the minerals, but I sold half the minerals to the other guy. Did you go down and visit it before you signed off? Oh, I still go. Mm -hmm. I still go. I go down to alumni every year and I go back and see if he's taking proper care of it. Because after I, after, after I grubbed the mesquite out, you know, when I first started grubbing that mesquite out, Dad said, now, Max, he says, I don't want to discourage you on, on that wheat, on mesquite grubbing. But those mesquite seeds, they'll stay viable for 10 years in the soil. Well, I didn't tell him this, but I thought, you're exaggerating, Dad. No seed will stay in the ground 10 years and sprout. Well, I found out that they'll stay in the ground for over 20 years. And I know that because I grubbed out the trees in this lot, which was fenced off. No cattle were getting in it. And 20 years later, there's still sprouts coming up from the seed. <laughs> so after I grubbed the big ones, I went out and I... I got an ATV and I'd, with a pressure sprayer, operate off the battery and I'd spot spray all of those little sprout. And they're still sprouting down there. Still sprouting. And, uh, the guy that bought it from me, he's let it go for four or five years, but he's out there spraying again now. Do you miss it? Oh yeah, miss going down there. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun camping out. I used to go down there, my son would go down there with me and we'd go out together and spray the mesquite seedlings and have a good time in the evening together, you know. 
take her dog down there. My son called it the dog's Disneyland. <laughs> well, the first thing they, those dogs would do when they'd get down there is find some manure and wallow in it. And I thought, until I knew better, I thought that crazy dog, he's just crazy. And of course, he's killing his scent. Uh, <laughs> smart how animals, funny how animals are smart like that. They, and that dog would charge the cattle. He had so much fun running the cattle. They, of course, they hadn't seen a dog run at them. They'd scare them. Well, the cattle wised up after a little bit, and they came back and ran at him. <laughs> so the dog took off running. <laughs> Well, as we wind down, is there any last memory you'd like to share about about your land you've owned for, for so long and grew up on and have such a strong family connection on? Well, the, the real life is a good one uh, from the standpoint of learning about life and living life and understanding what makes things work. I enjoyed it. I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything, uh, the growing up experience, but at the time, uh, man, it was tough. It was hard work. It was always work. Uh, but, you know, young kid, it doesn't bother you that much, but as I grew older, I said, I don't think I want to do this the rest of my life. And, and so, uh, and of course, anymore it's not like it used to be and labor intensive like it used to be. When I grew up everything was everything was labor intensive. And today they they geez, air conditioning and music and everything in your cab and you touch a switch and everything happens and used to everything was grunt work and it, it's just uh, so much different now than when it was with the with with the soil conservation, without plowing and leaving the land there with all the debris on it, it's completely different in that regard and certainly a lot better. It's a lot more cost efficient and uh, a lot better for your land. Uh, it's just uh, just amazing the transformation. It's just hard to imagine what's going to happen uh, in the future. Uh, as things get more expensive, farms have got to get bigger. It, it's it's amazing what has happened with prices these days. And uh, just the other day, I'm looking at and cash three or four hundred pounds are selling for two fifty a pound, and and uh, you know that's and when I when I was doing it, uh, typically they were like seven or eighty cents. Uh, so there's a big risk when you pay. When you pay for a calf at uh, three or four hundred pounds, and you're getting up to eight or nine hundred dollars, and you're buying uh, several hundred head for stockers, we used to, we'd always every year we would buy our cattle uh, in the uh, and keep them for a year. We'd buy them at about three or four hundred pounds and put them on uh, wheat pasture, and then and sell them the next fall at 700 pounds or so. And uh, if you lost cattle, it was really hurtful. In today's time, that's that's really got to be bad. So I don't envy those guys down there. Eh? Lack of lack of rain and all that cost. Of course, they're selling for a lot more too, so maybe it work, evens out okay. But... Uh, <laughs> Being a farmer, you don't have to go to Vegas to gamble. I'll tell you that. You're a bigger gambler than anybody in Vegas. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'd go go every year to the banker, and that's this is back when cattle were cheap, and I'd go, I need another $80,000 to buy cattle, and you know. But, uh, that was just something you did, and you hoped things worked out where you could pay him back and make some profit. Yeah. So, 
it's a rewarding life, but uh, I think you got to grow up. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know what's going to happen. You, you got to grow up on a farm to farm, in my judgment, because I don't know how anybody would would go into farming and hadn't been part of the farm. I just don't understand how you could possibly do it. So, you've got people like me who are investing in land and yet wanting to be a part of the farming kind of community, which is why I did it. I wanted to, I wanted to keep on experiencing that life, and uh, and also I, I regard it as a good investment, which. For many years it didn't look like it was going to be a good investment because the prices dropped down to half of what I paid for some of the land there for a while, while the interest rate went way up. So, I mean, it looked like the worst kind of decision was ever made, but fortunately I was able to hang on and, uh, and sell it at a good price. It's providing a good retirement. Well, we appreciate you sharing memories of your time growing up and your family and learning more about your land. Well, obviously I enjoyed it too. <laughs>